Alright, welcome back to the devlog series for Curious of Conquest, and welcome back to another delay. Yes, it's going to be another month before the default world map is finished. What can I say? I'm a slow 2D artist, but I'm quite happy with how it's turning out. So, for this month, instead of the world, let's talk about its inhabitants. The class system from Brigandine Legend of Forsena had a ton of strategic and tactical depth to it. Building teams of complementary heroes with classes that worked in synergy while having clear and complex progression helped make the game incredibly fun, and I decided to take that entire system and expand on it. First, let's discuss the overarching disclaimer for this devlog. Everything I say is subject to change, and I will do whatever I need to create a better version of the experience I'm striving for. Now, with that out of the way, let's discuss the story characters, and then the hero classes. Each character is different. Once the story mode is created by version 1.0, in several years, the story will be playable with set characters that do not change their growths or starting stats between playthroughs. However, for the open war mode, which will be available as soon as the alpha is up and running, the heroes each player starts with will be randomly generated based on a weighted system, so that the odds of an objectively overpowered or underpowered hero is significantly reduced. But every hero should have different starting stats and different growth rates. These stats are grouped into threes, with health points, technical points, and resolve points making up the resources. Strength, defense, and agility make up the physical attributes, while intelligence, resist, and skill make up the mental attributes. All classes have specific growth rates for each of these stats, and each stat contributes to different aspects of combat but each class has some use for most of the stats. Again, we're skimming over the details until they are more settled, and definitely look forward to a future devlog on Resolve in particular. But let's shift over to look at the next effective stat, the elements of the class. Every class has up to three elemental orbs, specific to being that class. I'll save deep discussion of the element system for a future devlog, but the concept is simply red beats green beats blue beats red, while black and white are strong against their opposite and weak against themselves. With this in mind, each character will have their class orbs, equipment orbs, and some skills will also add orbs. Some of these orbs will be attack orbs, while others would be defensive orbs, but the orbs that characters get from their class are both. So... With those two basic building blocks covered, let's move on to the part where things start to get unique and interesting. Every class will essentially have two lists of spells and abilities. One is the core list that characters of that specific class can use, and one is the mastery list. The skills and spells on the mastery list will persist after class changes once that class is mastered. So, how does one get mastery in a class? Five levels. However, not quite the way you might think. To begin working on mastering a class, a hero must gain at least one level while that class is actively equipped. This first level unlocks the ability to spend mastery tokens on the class. Mastery tokens are earned for every level in a class that is unlocked or mastered. After spending three mastery tokens, the class is ready to be mastered, which only requires gaining one additional level with that class in combat. I am, alternatively, considering modifying the way experience and leveling works to potentially just simplify things, and instead just let the player purchase levels with experience during the organized phase. As I said previously, a lot of the balance passes are yet to be done, so nothing is set in stone. So, to recap, Hero A starts as a fighter, and has example abilities 1 through 4, the last two of which are mastery abilities. So, once Hero A reaches 5 levels locked into the Fighter class, they are able to use abilities 3 and 4 after switching to a Ranger, a Sorceress, or whatever else. After mastering the Sorceress class, they would keep some of the spell list and take the ability to cast those spells to any class after. It continues this way until you have a customized high-level character with a list of spells and skills all its own. At present, I have also considered and previously created a boost system, where you can choose to spend mastery tokens to increase the stats and growth rates related to a class you currently have mastery in, 
rather than master many disparate classes. But I'm currently keeping the system disabled until playtests can begin, and I can start balancing with the fewest variables possible before adding more complexity. All classes have been grouped into two separate trees. Primarily, this is so that there can be smaller framed, agile characters, and big, bulky characters without skeletal structures shifting around during class changes. It always kind of bugs me when games do that. So these two trees are tentatively named the Fox Spirit Tree for the leaner builds, and the Boar Spirit Tree for the bulkier builds. Alright, so we have here the Fox Spirit Tree above and the Boar Spirit Tree below. To quickly address the colors of boxes, all the red boxes are martial classes that primarily function with physical attacks and abilities that are largely opposed by the defense stat, while the blue boxes are caster classes that primarily function with magic attacks and spells that are largely opposed by the resist stat. The green boxes are hybrid classes that don't perform as well in either magic or physical abilities as the dedicated classes, but have access to both. You'll notice that each of the spirit trees has access to each element, but for the fox spirit tree, the fire and earth elemental base classes are martial, whereas the water, light, and shadow are caster classes. Meanwhile, the reverse is true for the boar spirit tree. This is something I'll address more explicitly in a bit, but it's an aspect of imperfect balance that I've worked into the entire planning of the system. You'll see each tree transitions from a group of base classes into branching paths beneath each. I currently haven't decided whether choosing one particular branch under a base class will lock you out of the other potential progression from that class or not, but it is something I'm considering. At the bottom of the graphic, you'll see a detailed breakdown of the classes, and each class in the trees are marked with their intended role in combat. To draw attention to one important concept, while there is an even spread of each role and positional preference, the boar spirit tree is focused more on holding the line and staying in constant engagement with the enemy, while the fox spirit tree is more focused on flanking maneuvers, shorter engagements, and positional advantages. While there are classes in each tree that are exceptions to this, and both trees have some backline options, it really informs my intent with the split between the trees. My Headcanon largely involves the big bulky types standing at the front trading blows while the nimble lithe types tend to dance around and seek more opportune moments. There is no restriction, however, and just because the class is not intended to be used in any particular role does not mean it cannot be used there to find success. If you have any questions about the chart, absolutely drop a comment and I'll happily answer with my thoughts, intentions, and goals. So, now that we've gone over the data, let's talk philosophy, specifically the focus on perfect imbalance. The most well-known game of perfect imbalance is known to the English-speaking world as rock, paper, scissors. There are other games of the same concept, mostly originating from China and becoming especially popular in Japanese history as Sonsukumiken, meaning games played with the hand or fist where A beats B B beats C, and C beats A. Anyone who's familiar with Pokemon, Fire Emblem, or any of a number of other games may recognize this concept. This differs from any attempt at perfect balance, which is the concept of all options being completely equal, in a multitude of ways, but most importantly, it allows each and every option to be best in one particular situation, while being overshadowed in others, or even worst in some. There will still be numerical adjustments that must be made to actually polish the system, and reach a point where no class or combination of classes become the objective best, or even above average in all situations, but between elemental distributions, positional preferences, and role selection, I feel like I've ensured that every class has a particular situation where it can shine. In my experience, especially in the indie space, any attempt at perfect balance is only as successful as the system is simple. As a game grows in complexity, the more attempts to balance every option spirals into a maddening prospect, and the players generally become very loud and irate. 
I'm hoping to prevent myself from being driven mad attempting to balance the game with careful planning and consideration of the two trees and the branches they're in. If I'm successful, nobody will be able to say that any particular class is always better than any other class, since they will each have their best use cases and worst use cases. To achieve this goal, I'll be starting with an attempt to balance the base classes, in example, having the ranger always beat the soldier, which should always beat the fighter, which should always beat the ranger. This should not be due only to elements, but also statistics and the roles they're intended for. With each additional layer of complexity, balance will become more and more complicated, especially once cross-class builds are taken into consideration. But I believe if I can get a baseline where every class fills a niche, it should end up good enough TM, so that I don't spend the rest of my life balancing Cures of Conquest. I do have other games I want to eventually make, after all. Stat checks and ability combination that invalidate the intended roles and elemental matchups between classes will be monitored closely, but I will likely err on the side of what I think is more fun. Hopefully, with some luck and plenty of hard work, I'll be able to reach a point where every class is, at the very least, fun to use in a particular playstyle or strategy. I also hope to be able to keep different strategic considerations somewhat balanced because nobody likes a stale meta and, again, I would prefer to not continue balancing the rest of my life. So, with all this in mind, where is the system currently at? Well, I have coded everything for defining classes, changing between classes, mastering classes, marking the skills and spells as transfer abilities so they carry over from mastered classes to any other class the hero changes to, and quite a bit more on the system level. The only thing I really have left on the code and implementation side is the actual content of the class system. The individual spells and abilities still need to be created, the individual classes still need to be created, and the models and animations still need to be created for each of the 95 classes. That's going to take a lot of time. As with the rest of the game, the system level work is almost entirely done unless I change something. However, I still need to do almost all of the art and content creation. The nice thing about the system I created is that it doesn't care. At all. About anything. The class change system is just handed a tree, and the system identifies what classes the hero has mastered, and figures out what valid class change options are available. I could have a single class tree, or a hundred, and the system wouldn't care. The class base stats, growth rates, skills, spells, and elements being swapped in and out are likewise independently defined. The system itself is indifferent. All it cares about is which unit is changing classes, which class is being removed, and which class is being added. Everything has been built in a very modular way, so that it can be reused for just about any game I would ever need classes for. The monster races work the same way, except that they are one-way advancements, available once the requirements are met. So, what's next? First, I hope to finish the world map by next month. Hope. After the world map is complete, I'll be working on the UI, UX, and input systems. Once those are complete, I start implementing and modeling classes. I'll be holding off on animations until all the classes and monsters are implemented into the game and the alpha is available for playtesting. It will likely be toward the end of next year, at earliest, but if you're interested in having conversations on Curious of Conquest, its development, or alpha beta testing, check out the Brigandine Discord in the description of this video, where I have been granted a sub-channel from my spiritual successor to Brigandine Legend of Forza. And that's it. The conclusion of the Curious of Conquest devlog for September. I hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, have a good one.